Well, welcome everybody to the Flower Podcast. I am really excited to have Amanda here from Studio Modine. I want to make sure I say it right. Um, Welcome so much, Amanda. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I know um, some friends of mine, uh, Amy Osaba and Mary McLeod and like all of them back many years ago when they, they were kind of like, oh, are you following Studio Modine? Are you following them? And I'm like on Instagram and I'm like, uh, at that time I wasn't and I made sure I did. And I've always found your work to be really inspirational. And I just, there's something about it that's different and unique. And I'm just thrilled to have you on the podcast today. Um, Thank you. I, and Very I, high <laughs> well, I um I just got your copy of your book, so Ikebana Unbound, um which I th- as I as I beat the microphone with it. Um I I can't wait to dig more into it because I think it's just going to unlock a lot of things for me. Um I want to really talk about that, but first before we do that, we always start at the beginning um about your flower journey and how did you fall into this world of flowers. Oh, you know, that always happens at the beginning of an interview. And I, I feel a little dumbfounded every time because I think, wait, 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 okay. 10 years ago, how, and then how did I get here? You know, it's, it's really a blur, especially when you run your own business. It just happens like that. And you know? yeah, a blink of an eye. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, especially in our industry, because I feel like, I mean, I I can't believe it was uh, two and a half months ago, I was in Las Vegas at the AIFD symposium. And and it's like, you know, every one week blurs into another, into another, and then here we are. So I totally understand. I feel that. And then I I had a baby six months ago, so it feels like time has, I don't don't know, I can't keep track. Time is a flat circle or whatever, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to answer your question, <laughs> flower journey. Um, yeah, I, I sort of took a meandering path. I, I studied environmental economics in school. Uh, so naturally, um, I, I graduated and, and got a job uh, completely unrelated to that. Uh, I was in marketing for a number of years and sort of staring out the window like I am now uh, from my desk thinking, okay, is, is this it? Is this my whole life? Is this what it's going to mm. look like? Um, and I think inside I knew that there was more that I wanted to explore. There was more out there. Um, and there was a, a I guess, a, a very timid, creative person on the inside who just needed uh, fertile ground you know, to, to play, to explore, um, and to, to figure it out. So, uh, with that, um, it's just, I sort of at a crossroads in my career and I considered going into interior design, um, or pursuing my first passion, my first, my really true, you know, enduring love. And that's the love of food. Maybe there was something there in food for me or flower arranging. Um, I was putting flowers together and cooking and hosting a lot of my friends, or bringing them over to the house and you know, sort of learning as I went. Um, I took a, a workshop with Little Flower School. Um, do you remember them? Who? Like the, um, Little Flower School. That's yeah. Sarah and Nicole. Yeah, right? Okay. So they came to Oakland and they did a little uh, one day, or really half day workshop. So on a whim, um, my partner at the time signed me up. Um, he got me a ticket and that's when it feels like kind of everything exploded in my mind. Just, okay, I'd never, truly, I'd, I'd never considered the way light plays on a leaf um, and how you know, a velvety uh, Dusty Miller um, might bounce light differently in an arrangement when paired with um, garden rose or something like that. Um, I, I probably still have photos, actually, of that first arrangement I made, which, uh, looking back on, is not very good. But, you know, I think it's important to, to keep those images alive in our minds. It keeps us humble. <laughs> well, but you know what, though? It's like a mile marker. It's where you began. 
and you can right. see the growth. Totally, totally. Yeah. And uh, you know, something too, um, I'm, I'm very guilty of is sitting on a lot of images of work and I'll let it age a year, two years, three years. And then when I'm having to update my phone is when I rediscover these images. And I think, hey, that wasn't half bad. Um, you know, I, I feel that. Sailed, but, you know, um, yeah, there, there's some there's some interesting ideas that were being explored in that moment in time. Interesting. So anyway, um, with the flower journey, uh, having that half day with Sarah and Nicolette and being in such good company with other people who were really interested in learning flowers and not necessarily to start a business, but just for the love of flowers um, that ignited in me something. Um, something crazy, crazy enough to quit my job, you know, in the, the next month. So, uh, yeah, that's my flower journey. Oh, uh, and then I, I also started by uh, freelancing. So there was the the catalyzing workshop that, okay, I have to quit my job. Um, and then also reaching out to a lot of the, in my opinion, some of the best studios in the Bay Area to, to work with. Um, I, I really, I asked them, hey, uh, is is there room in your studio for someone to clean bases, um, sweep the floor, uh, process flowers? I didn't know that the word was process at that point. You know, it was taking leaves off of the flowers. Um, really, I was just eager to learn, um, eager to work, and excited to to be a part of the community and and be in the presence of flowers. I love the way you phrase that. Do you have space for, for me to do these things for you? And um, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. And I feel like it's a very um, a warm, sincere, uh, you know, genuine approach where it doesn't come across necessarily like you're trying to mooch off somebody else to learn or I don't know. Sometimes, you know, it's very, that's a lot of people have, don't know how to say that or don't know how to ask. And I just think I've never heard someone ask or phrase it that way before. So I really like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's tough because, you know, you're going to be navigating someone's studio space. And I, I knew just tangentially that event work was high stress work. So as much as possible, I wanted to be out of the way and, you know, learning by doing, learning by watching. Um, and yeah, it was, sure. it was really a privilege to learn um, from some of, some of the best. Um, very early in my career, I worked uh, quite a bit with Natalie Bowen, um, who's a San Francisco florist. And um, I think more than anything, working with Natalie, I learned the, I guess that, that really when you're working in flowers, you're working in hospitality. That's something yes. that I, I hadn't connected until I saw just how warm she was with her clients and how it didn't stop with the clients. She was warm with the vendors, so the flower farmers, the wholesalers, the people who um, put things in boxes and you know, carted them to our, our van. Um, she was warm to her staff, um, her full-time staff, and she was so incredibly warm to the freelance designers that would come in every week and make these flowers so hmm. so how did you navigate into a uh, studio modine well i actually met um, my founding creative partner at natalie studio um, we had worked together with natalie and then also with uh, another studio called shotgun floral and uh, ivanka and i locked eyes and we would often be on the same jobs, but we never spoke a word to each other. Uh, I think it took a month or two before either one of us approached the other. And that's simply because we both were there to learn. We were both there to work. And um, we'd be in our corner kind of figuring out, okay, if I have a focal flower here, um, then where do I put the next one, right? And then how do I get the edges of the arrangement to either soften or or um, how do I create a line through this piece and I noticed she was also treating it like you know a high stakes thing <laughs> sure so I so I, I, I we both acknowledge each other's seriousness and the hustle um, and when we finally sat down um, I think 
during a lunch break and were able to connect, um, we, we got along really well. <laughs> That's um, great. Yeah, Ivanka had married into a Japanese American family. And so uh, you know, she was sort of interested in more minimalistic design. Um, you know, we were kind of skirting around Ikebana arranging. Um, her mother-in-law was a master of tea. And so, you know, the tea ceremony um, is, I guess, I mean, really the flowers are part of the tea ceremony. So I think that's the way it's nested as far as hierarchy. Um, you know, going over to the place and enjoying uh, that really rich um, heritage that they that they lived in still and kept alive um, for their family and friends was, was such a pleasure. Um, and at the same time, you know, I had always been interested in more pared back, minimalistic living as well, something that... Um, I think because I have a, a noisy mind, I, I really want everything else to be quiet and calm uh, mm. and have order. So Ivanka and I really connected over more minimalistic, uh, more poetic, more storytelling inside the flowers. And that was something that event work didn't afford us, right? Because event work it's really it's one it's a feeling it's a moment in time it's a celebration for weddings so there's an exuberance that's sort of required for the occasion and exuberance is a beautiful wonderful emotion but it's one emotion and i think we both knew that True. flowers there's a lot there's a lot to explore there's you know, the whole life cycle of a flower, too, is rich with poetry that could be explored, right? And there's death, there's decay. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot there. So Sure. With that, so, uh, we started yeah. our studio together, sort of more focused on storytelling and editorial. But um, then we noticed that our we started attracting clients who were interested in, um, I guess, more... I don't want to say simplistic, but more sculptural flower arranging, more, um, I guess, unexpected wedding florals for their celebrations. And so they started reaching out to us for that. So how did people find you at first? Was social media around then or was it more word of mouth? <laughs> um, their social media was a thing. The year was two thousand. 13. So I think in, Instagram was a thing already, right? I don't know. Yeah, maybe Instagram. barely, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it was nascent. It was it was uh, wild back then. You know, you could just post your coffee in a cup and that was a thing. And people actually saw it. <laughs> people actually saw it. <laughs> All to eat for <laughs> breakfast. Um, yeah, social media was a thing. Um, I'm trying to think. People found us. There were a lot of referrals that we had within our communities as well. Um, Ivanka through her church. Um, there were a lot of people getting married who you know, were interested in supporting a local business. Um, and people in my community as well getting married. Um, I'm a Bay Area native, so there are a lot of people here um, who have remained um, as well. Sure. I'm trying to think. Well we also just reached out directly to a lot of people we wanted to work with. Um, I think, I don't know. Yeah. I think that's probably pretty important. To well, it is. And sometimes people forget that and they think, you know, it's always coincidental how you just stumble across things. But no, sometimes it does take a little legwork to kind of yeah. get your name out there a little bit. So, yeah, entirely. Um, I think um, that's great. Yeah. So, I, um, and fascinated, um, you know, even within inside your Instagram bio, you know, how you refer to Ikebana and you refer to, you know, that sort of as part of your aesthetic kind of. I think it's real unusual to embrace that for event work or to do that. But I I feel like I don't know. I, do you mind talking about Ikebana just a little bit because I feel like we've never really dived into this on our podcast and I and there was one person we were trying to get on a long time ago but there was a lot of language issues and so it didn't work out real well and so um 
uh, anyway, uh, I feel like there's like in your book, I notice how you talk about different types and that, and, and maybe how you've sort of made this your own. I'm kind of curious about that process. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess as a sort of primer, um, at the very top, I should say that, uh, Ivanka and I both are self-studied, self-taught, so we're outside of the the paradigm, right? Um, Or without outside of the the formal schools of Ikebana. Ikebana itself is something that, as a florist or as a person who's sensitive to the natural world, you are more or less in conversation with Ikebana whenever you approach the workbench, whenever you. pluck a flower from uh, the community garden and bring it into your home. You're in conversation with Ikebana. And that's because Ikebana itself literally means uh, living flowers or making flowers come alive. And the relationships that are explored in Ikebana are enduring. It's endured centuries. And it's really the exploration of the relationships or the experiences of man, earth, and heaven. And that's, that's easy to remember, right? Because you just think like mm-hmm. me, ground, what's going on, um, on the celestial. And the way that these relationships are explored is through this natural material that, mind you, isn't limited to flowers, right? Um, I think the more contemporary um, students and practitioners of Ikebana see any, any kind of material as fair game. And that's what makes it really an exciting medium. Um, what I think is important to remember is in, in each piece that you endeavor to create, you are working with movement, you're working with balance, you're working with rhythm, you're working with harmony. Um, and, and that's sort of, you know, outside of those parameters, you're sort of, you're finding your own voice, you know. Um, it's your interpretation. It's not, and that that's more within the modern, I guess, tradition of Ikebana, because uh, the older schools are going to be more focused on the the presentation of a certain relationship between man, earth, and heaven, with um, pretty strict rules around how to create balance, right? Um, and so when I say you know, modern, I say in the last like 100 years, <laughs> modern, and that Why? would be us, right? Um, is there is, our eye sees balance probably in similar ways, but I think what's ex- interesting to explore is um, how Scott's version of balanced is going to look different than my version of balanced. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I or, do. Okay, so what's what's rhythmic to you and what's rhythmic to me will probably 95% look the same, um, but it's the extra 5% where it's interesting to, to see the differences and the interpretations. And so wow. um, the book that you have that, uh, on your desk uh, provides that sort of context and that sort of prompt, but it's really designed for the home arranger. I like to call that person the flower curious person. And really, I was writing this book for myself um, before I had created a career in flowers, um, before I had a studio practice for flowers. Um, This is the person who is uh, growing a a vegetable garden and notices a flowering cranberry bean and wants to bring that inside and play around with it. Or the person who is foraging from the parking lot behind their work, which I literally did. Um, It's not someone who has, you know, $200 to go to the flower market with and bring a car full of flowers home. Although $200 in this market wouldn't get you a car full of flowers. That's a, that's a whole nother podcast, but you know what I mean, right? Absolutely. No, I totally, I'm feeling that. Yeah, totally. Um, well, that's really interesting because I, I, that makes a lot of sense after just perusing the book because I haven't dug into it. I just got it last night, like I said. But um, I um, I appreciate that because it's so it's so interesting that being that 
I, I will find something like I'll, I'll be at a garden center or I'm outside or I'm, I, I drive my, as I've said many times on the podcast, I'm driving down the road, driving my family crazy because I'm like, Oh, like, like for example, if, if you're on YouTube, see, so Osage orange. So I've been driving past this tree and I'm watching this branch get heavier and heavier with all of these Osage oranges. And, I'm, and so finally the other night, I, I like had to stop and cut one, cut a branch and, and, and harvest a few because they're just so beautiful to me. And, um, you know, I had to bring it inside. So I totally feel like, you know, you're speaking to me when you say that and you describe that. So um, <laughs> I can appreciate that. I, you know, I feel like to your aesthetic, seeing how you bring all of that in to your event work is what I, I really love because I feel like it makes it unusual. Um, it also makes every, and maybe I'm overstepping my bounds, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost makes every event special and unique. Is that true? That's my hope. <laughs> if you okay, mission accomplished. I'm just going to hang my hat. There you go. <laughs> Mic drop. There you go. It's all over. Yeah. That's really nice of you to say. Yeah, well, I feel like, though, that a lot of times people get um, very, you know, like they, you know, like when we get a lot of wedding orders where I work and it's so funny how you'll see every wedding having the exact same things in them and mm -hmm. from the same person. And I'm kind of like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of other beautiful elements out there that are seasonal that sometimes people miss, I think. And and I feel like that's that opportunity to not only embrace nature, but also to um, create a truly unique event. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're kind of talking about is that sense of place and time. Hmm. And for us, that that's the, I guess that's the magic and the kind of misery. Can I say misery? of event work, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it is It is so tough to work that way when you're trying to capture um, something that's hyper seasonal um, and really uh, emblematic of that moment. It, there's, there's actually quite a bit of production rigor to get that all the pieces to come together and for them to fall into place and look flawless for an event. So I say it it's a lot harder to work this way, but it's actually a lot more fulfilling if you're coming mm. at event work um, with more, um, I guess, more event work as an art form rather than a business. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. I will say, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, and our team here at the studio is incredible for supporting that and, and wanting to keep pushing, keep pushing the production rigor so that we can push the artistry. And yeah, so I feel very, very, very lucky that that's how we get to work. So how, how, let me ask this question, because I feel like that you mentioned your team and I, and I feel like that is really for a company like you, like you have is the sweet sauce in some ways. Um, because you obviously can't do it all, right? Um, yeah, I mean, duh. Um, I idea, but, no. but I'm just saying like, and you live in a place that has a wonderful floral market, you know, in San Francisco. And, um, but a lot of what you bring in, I'm sure is things that are either, you know, sourced differently. Um, and so, does everybody like sit around and collaborate a little bit and then people bring in different elements or how does that work? Because like, I, I know I was watching a, a video, I think on your Instagram and you, here are these huge branches coming into like a bay door. And I'm just like, wow, those are amazing. And then of course the design work was gorgeous. And I'm thinking, okay, did somebody like go scout for that or um, did somebody go under the cover a night or, and, and, you know, do some civic pruning or how, how do you approach some of that? Um, uh, well, to your point, San Francisco 
the San Francisco flower market is pretty incredible. It, if all of our jobs were local jobs, then it would be a lot easier to try and work the way that we work. Um, but because you know our studio, I'm trying to change the ratio, but it's about 50-50 destination versus local. So is really? yeah, so the local stuff is, I, I don't wanna say easy, but it's, it's a lot easier. Um, and it's when we're working in say, what was a really challenging place? Phoenix, when we were working um, out there last year, that was a really tough place to work because um, it's quite arid there and there's not that same sort of... Lushness everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I don't even want to say like enthusiasm to work that way because I think that there are people um, out there who want to work that way. I, you know, I think of my friend Randy at Carte Blanche Design. She is fully working in that way, it's just that she has climate to contend with. So you can't really deliver dead flowers <laughs> to a client or crispy flowers to a client for an event. Um, and so, you know, it's it's the whole supply chain, really. If, if the demand isn't there, then you're not gonna have those like small farms that create really thoughtful programming and put um, heirloom seeds in the ground and plant these things that are really magical, but maybe don't have the best shipability, or they don't travel that well. They don't travel beyond fifty miles or fifteen miles, right? So, like, it the the math doesn't make sense to work that way in these places. And so, to try and capture that type of magic uh, anywhere other than, say, San Francisco and L.A. and New York, where there are really big flower markets. Um, or actually in Oregon. Oregon's got some really great stuff. And Utah. <laughs> Sorry. But those are like the four places I could think of. Um, it's tough. That means that we're visiting uh, not one, not two, but like 10 nurseries. We're trying to get into wholesale yards in case they have other stuff. Um, we'll also go to the big box to see what they're growing. Um, that looks like reaching out to uh, food farms because they typically tend to have like a little bit of something growing that could could make sure. sense for what we do. That looks like arriving several days early to you know, be in the environment and then start doing our scouting for any civic pruning that needs to occur. Um, and you know, with the sustainability sustainability initiatives that we have in place, we're trying to, and we're working actively working to minimize how much we import for our events. So we're looking uh, to work as gently as possible. And it's a, it's a little bit maddening, to, to be perfectly honest, to be very transparent about it. It's, it's very challenging to work this way um, with the destination work. Locally, it, it's easy. It's, it's, it's easier. It's a little bit breezy because we have um, Gather Flora. I don't know if you've... Um, yes. Follow. Okay, so yeah, you know about them. You know they're they're doing the hard work, really. They're doing the aggregating that um, makes you know what was previously a hundred emails really ten emails, and so we are we owe them a great deal. That's incredible. Well, I it's just like in the last three minutes, I now have like an explosion of questions here. So I want to. Uh, we're going to come, I, I want to circle back to sustainability. There's no question. But before we get to that, you're talking about doing destinations and that's like a 50, 50 ish ratio for you. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like a lot of times people don't know, um, how to either attract those bigger clients or to start transitioning their business into offering these bigger, these bigger events. So I'm kind of curious if you have any tips or thoughts on how to help people really kind of, um, I don't know how to, I, maybe how to grow their business in that kind of an area since you're doing it. I'm just didn't know if what your process was or what you think would help. Yeah. Um, well, with the destination piece, um, with my founding creative partners, she, so her family 
who's in Europe, she's, she's Eastern European. So there was always the thought, you know, we, we wrote down a very ambitious five year plan, which involved getting um, our business to be largely destination um, so that we could be with our families or travel. We were in our early 20s, so and traveling was something that we really bonded over. So the idea sure. of event work was, okay, it's a season. It's a summer. Maybe a summer and a fall. And then that leaves us six months, um, really the rest of the year, to live wherever and just be vagabonds. Did that happen? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you mean... Early on. <laughs> Wow. Gosh, and I thought you just lived happily ever after. So yeah. things never go like planned. But it's, but you know what, though? I appreciate you saying that. And I also appreciate the fact that you took the time to set some lofty goals. And that's, you know, it's kind of like it's, I always like to think it's better to set these goals and fall short of them than to not set anything and then don't do, you don't accomplish anything. So good for you. <laughs> Yeah, so, so part of that was um, having a certain number of destination events. Um, we were very specific in this too, and so the other thing, the other things on the list that I can remember, and this was this is, uh, ten or eleven years ago that we wrote this list down, um, was working with um, certain planners. Right, we were like, oh, with, without knowing really what that meant or what that looked like, because we had never done events of such a scale we were like yeah it's sure. cool one day to work with like one of the industry's top planners <laughs> let's email her <laughs> and see what she says and sure enough people responded you know a couple of people responded and that was really enough to to get you know they were also interested i guess in what we were offering and so they gave us a shot we did our best and we just kept baking in the learnings from each of these little bites that people would give us um, another thing on that list was to actually uh, have a book so it's mm. cool that we were able to get that done that's incredible <laughs> yeah. so if somebody was starting out then are you saying that do you think because you had the goals that pushed you to be more assertive or more more extroverted in order like to reaching out to planners or potential clients or do you think that was just like you knew you had to put the boots on the ground and just really do the legwork uh, i think that having that list of goals was really useful for us because then when there was downtime which there was plenty of when you're just starting out Sure. There was always alignment as to what the next step would be. We'd look at the list again. It was just handwritten on a, you know, on a piece of paper. It was on our studio fridge for a long time. And then we'd say, oh, today seems as good a day as any to try and book a destination event. <laughs> you know? So then we would do a lot of research. Who is working in the south of France? Um, who are the photographers? Who are the caterers? Who are the event planners? Who are the, what are the venues? Like, where would a place... Um, what seems interesting? What, where is, where can we apply our design philosophy um, and make a difference for a client? You know, and that made it easy, sort of in a way, to figure out what the day to day work would look like. And you know, we both, we both were really serious about creating um, a sustainable business, sustainable in in that in the definition of the word that it sustained our lives and our families. Um, and now we're really adding, you know sustainability in the maybe the more conventional way that we've been thinking about sustainability from a climate perspective. Right. But you can't really talk about climate if you can't um, guarantee that you, you're going to have enough money to pay your rent. You know, there's just a, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have to kind of go step by step to get to that place. Yeah, I totally understand. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> that so I think, it, yeah, well, I think I, I'm really intrigued. And, and maybe this is just my lack of experience in this department, but I'm intrigued by the fact that you thought, oh, if I want to do a wedding in the south of France, let me reach out to people in the south of France doing weddings or or venues or, you know, like I'm saying. And 
and sort of make those connections and, you know, and see what comes out of it. And that's how you began. And I think that's really, um, uh, I don't know, I guess I just would think that that's more client based. Like you have some client here, you know, you have George Clooney that wants to get, you know, married or whatever in, uh, you know, San Marino or in Italy somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. Lake Como. And, yeah. and, you know, so yeah, I always figured it was the client that sort of drug you along, but of course, that's just one way of doing it. The other way I think is really interesting too. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, mean, I, I could see that being a really successful strategy for someone else as well. But, um, you know, my founding business partner was an immigrant and then I, I was a child of immigrants. So between the two of us, we didn't really have too many, um, George Clooney's in our Rolodex. <laughs> 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 of course not. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, okay, so you, I know you've mentioned sustainability from um, a lot of uh, different perspectives. Um, I think um, your design style and your aesthetic also lends yourself to that. Um, I, I, I have to ask this question because I, I thought it was really um, interesting uh, that I saw somewhere where you referenced, uh, an impact environmental impact study. And I thought for your business, and I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever heard of someone else doing that. That wasn't like Apple or, you know, some Google or some company like that. Um, tell me about that process. Tell me about sort of maybe your ethos as you approach this maybe. And I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Well, I mentioned to you that I studied environmental economics in school. So I didn't know how that was going to connect to what I was doing. And I was okay just living in that mystery for a long time. Um, you know, well, I that's honest. I love that. <laughs> um, and I mentioned to you as well that I feel so lucky to have the team that we have now. Right. So we have Tiffany on our team who's got 10 plus years of event. Um, production and creative uh, experience. And she, she is really just, it, it's so hard to find someone who's as good on the left side of the brain as the right side of the brain. And the, the value she adds to the team is just enormous. We also have Mia on our team who uh, also studied environmental science and she's a recent graduate. So she came to us through our intern program Something that I always fantasized about was creating a studio where we could all sort of bring our interests outside of the work into the workplace um, and also allow for or create a studio space where we could also live out our values. Right. Mm. So something yes. that me and I connected on was uh, sustainability from the get go. Um, a project of hers while she was in school was collecting smalls, um, sourcing smalls and then reselling them, you know, so vintage. And it was uh, after she had come on several jobs and sort of remarked, because she was outside of the industry, she sort of remarked on like how much waste you generate <laughs> in, in this work that I thought, you know what, yeah, that's the dark side of events. That's something that I've thought about for a long time and has kept me up at night. You know, it just, when you see bags and bags and bags of trash um, or things that could be composted go straight into a dumpster, that's really tough. Um, so it was on the drive back from our Phoenix job that my uh, my life partner and I were talking about the work that was toward the end of the season. And, you know, we were thinking like, oh gosh, what is the, the trail of destruction we've left? <laughs> you know, what, right. in our wake, what does that look like? How many bags, how many pounds of green waste have we generated? How many, how much plastic, um, how many miles, have our flowers traveled? How many miles have we personally traveled as a destination studio? Um, I was also, let's see, six months pregnant with our son and thinking a lot about 
what sort of world you would inherit. And I, you know, there's that cognitive dissonance there where you realize like the work that you do to nourish yourself, your family, your team, um, and provide this beauty for your clients. Um, is that going to make Earth unlivable for our unborn child? And I laugh about it because it's just so dark that you kind of have to, just to be able to like put on your shoes for the day, you have to find something, uh, something workable in that. So I, I really wanted to re-examine what we did as a studio. And so I just on our Slack channel, I mentioned to Mia, hey, you know, it'd be really interesting to gather up, tally up uh, from, from the production plans that we have for this season, how many miles we've traveled. I'm curious to see what the carbon impact would be. And, you know, she grabbed onto that and was like, yes, I can do this. Uh, you know, she has, she has a researcher's mind and she can, she can pull a report together like no other. And so she started digging through all the production plans looking at uh, all of our freelancers' travels from their points of origins to our job sites, um, looking at uh, the flowers that we source and where they came from and how many were local from someone like Gather who brings things from farms nearby like Bluma Farm or Front Porch if you're in San Francisco, uh, versus how much stuff came from Dutch Direct, Dutch Direct boxes where it's coming straight from the auction to our studio. And we started doing that. And I, I was curious, um, before we started the 2022 season, I wanted to just kind of do an accounting, business as usual. What does it look like? Um, what What's the impact of the flower sourcing, the flower travel, the staffing, um, down to like the level of granularity that Mia's gone to in these reports is looking at whether we were eating plant-based meals, you know? <laughs> so. Wow. It's, it's really awesome just to have, have the idea and then also have the team that's invested in the idea and down to do that work. And so I mentioned Tiffany, too, who joined our team for this season. She's also interested in this work, and she's got the spreadsheets collecting um, with even more granularity where the flowers come from. And that's, that's giving us um, a much better sense of the mileage of the flowers because there is no real... Uh, there's no, I guess there's no transparency around that, right? Even if our wholesaler wanted to tell us where the flowers came from, they may not hold on to all the information. They already have to manage the variety and the quantity and my order alongside you know, 20 other orders for that day. They don't have time to talk about whether this came from Colombia or, you know, Guatemala. So, so with that, I mean, that's kind of a roundabout way to talk about the sustainability piece, but I, I hope I answered your question a little bit. Well, I, f I feel like, though, you are bringing an awareness to it. Were you, so 2021 was your first time you did that? Is that correct? Uh, yes, and we did it in post. So we ran the whole season, business as usual, as I mentioned, and then it was uh, over the winter that we started crunching the numbers and creating a methodology for our approximation of the flower mileage because sure. even now we don't have a very good number or a very clear number uh, we basically just work off of the biggest number that it could be which is pretty big yeah so are you surprised uh surprised uh, horrified mortified mm -hmm. terrified <laughs> a lot of words like this um but i also felt Kind of relieved if that makes sense just to really see it for what it is and then i thought okay well if we're doing this and we have the i guess the privilege the space to be able to sit down and look at our numbers because we have enough of a break in the season i'm thinking about the studios that are working year round and doing you know 50 60 events they don't have the time to slow down and think about their numbers so because we do and we have them, we got to tear the bandaid off and we got to just share this, you know, and it's without judgment, without shame. Um, and I think that's, that's actually the reception that we've received. It's like a lot of our industry peers were interested in the numbers uh, and sort of 
what was, what's the word? Encouraging. Yeah, encouraging. That was something that I, I didn't expect. Um, they were encouraged that we were looking at him. Well, I mean, that's such a huge step. Yes. That most people don't even do. And I, and I, and I think just having that awareness, um, I'm sure in 2022, probably, I'm sure you've made some changes. Um, I mean, we're halfway through the year. Um, any feel for the impact difference that you've made already just in your awareness of it now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we set... So we looked at, we created the benchmarks from 2021, and then we also set some pretty ambitious goals uh, around sourcing and end of life for the flowers for all subsequent seasons. So that looks like on the front end, uh, buying as many local flowers as possible. And that's, I mean, that's sort of, it's, it's much more pleasurable to work that way anyway. So it's kind right. of like an easy one, right? But also it, it builds resilience in in the networks of growers. And that's so important so that maybe one day we can work again in Phoenix and there will be a plethora of farms that could provide flowers for us and for our events. And I'm not really advocating for them to grow uh, garden roses or anything, but I think if we can work on design piece, so what makes sense for a Phoenix wedding in that climate, and that's also translated to what's available on the farm, then that would be very exciting. Sure. Um, and then well, the other piece too is end of life, right? So um, right. that's reusing or investing in hard goods that will reuse constantly um, or lending that inventory out as well. Um, and also just uh, being much more diligent about trash sorting and composting as much as we can and upcycling the materials. That's interesting that you bring up the hard good side of it because I feel like that is another one of those situations that, um, you know, every event's different, every event's special, the aesthetic, the venue, the, um, the style, the size of the tables, the, you know, all these things are different. Um, how have your customers related to what decisions you've made with regard to that? You know, I, I feel so lucky that our clients really get what we're trying to do. Um, even if it's not overt, you know, I, that's outside of picking through our social media, you really wouldn't see these types of, um, you wouldn't really know about the sustainability aspect right. of what we're trying to do. Um, and we're fine with that. I, I've thought about whether it's something that we should bring more awareness to for our clients, and, and maybe that's something we'll do in the future. But I think outside looking in, they sort of they see what we're doing, and they're like, "Yes, they get it." Um, I I haven't had any pushback as far as uh, the hard goods with our clients, you know, especially because again, I think investing in pieces that you'll reuse over and over. Um, means that they're probably pretty well made, they look good, and they, I think more importantly, defy trends. Because, mm. you know, it, you sort of see that in fashion too. It's when you're chasing trends that you create even more waste. That's when you have to yes. refresh your wardrobe every season. And I'm not going to refresh our hard goods inventory every season. That is just, that's overhead. That doesn't make sense. And um, then we can't actually really invest in the pieces either. So. How many different, this is, this is kind of a loaded question. I know that I'm catching you off guard. How many different pieces do you think you have in your inventory that you design with regularly? Um, I can, I'm thinking of the bowls I always reach for. There's probably five p styles that we end up grabbing all the time. Um, there's, you know, there's going to be like the footed ceramic, which works for a lot of contexts, um, and holds a lot of water. So we don't have to use foam. We can fit a frog in there. We can fit chicken wire in there. We can fit tape along the top and it's largely hidden. Um, that's a shape that works really well for our event work. We also use a lot of little low dishes to do sort of Ikebana inspired 
satellite pieces. Mm, That's sure. how we incorporate that more minimalistic, airy feel into our event work. Because you still sort of need, I guess, or a lot of our clients still want like the, the pomp and circumstance of a, of a centerpiece, right? You can't really avoid that for a celebration. Um, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to dig through our inventory to take a photo for you. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's interesting because I mean, I, I love that approach. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense, especially as you're trying to work through this, this particular issue. Um, I'm really excited about that. And, and that kind of is leading me to something that I saw, um, mentioned, I saw a quote. Uh, so one of our past guests, Emily Newman, who, uh, has, if I made, which you have a incredible, um, course through them. Um, if people are interested in taking any of your courses, that's a, a great place to, to go and start and see. Um, I, I noticed one of the, I guess it was perhaps somebody who took the course commented on how you approach pricing and your pricing method, um, which is always a popular um, topic on our podcast. And so I'm curious um, how you view that. And, and if you don't mind, I know we don't have time here just to unpack everything with it, but um, just kind of generally what, how you approach that. And um, I'm just curious how you do that. Yeah, oh, happy to share. I, I'm pretty passionate about pricing because none of this, none of these shenanigans really work unless you've got the pricing piece nailed. Um, and so I'll say in our uh, course, The Art and Business of Flowers, that's hosted on If I Made, and really a collaboration between Emily's team and our team, um, because we were looking at uh, what would be the most useful or the highest impact education product we could make for the people out there who are flower curious. Mm -hmm. I think the thing people forget um, is to approach pricing holistically. It's easy to get stuck in the details. You're looking at just material costing and labor, um, and you think that that gets you a lot of the way there. Um, maybe you're including your utilities and your studio rent, and you think, okay, yes, I've got my pricing on lock if I have it as a, a factor of these, these things. Um, but there's also the cost, the very hard cost um, of opportunity. And so that's something that I, I always talk about uh, for our students is what does it really cost to miss uh, a family birthday party because you're working? Mm. Okay, so I, I, didn't, I didn't think you were going there, but I'm really glad you are. So go ahead. <laughs> well, this is what I mean by holistic, right? Is we have to look at um, not just the material, the labor, the overhead, but also the cost of opportunity. Um, the time that you spent working, what else could you have been doing? Could you have been working a different job and making a different salary? Um, could you have had that time off? And there's value in that too, right? I think we've all yeah. kind of realized after this pandemic. Um, and then also the cost of innovation. And that is basically, I mean, that's on top of opportunity, it's the cost of taking your business into the future. Uh, and that's creating runway for yourself for these other harebrained ideas that you might have, right? So you sort of need to be pricing in a way where you're encompassing all of those things so that you not only are paying for your bills today, paying your team well today, but that you also have room to grow. Um, and you don't necessarily need to grow in volume, but you could grow in um, as complexity. You could also grow in simplicity. That's something that I'm learning in this season of my life is uh, the value of rest and the value of time with family and friends and just, you know, not being at work. So, I, so how, yeah, how does that translate more specifically? Because when you mentioned several of those things that 
are obvious you know you're paying your people you're paying for your product paying your your overhead and all those things but if you're trying to encompass i, I mean these in, these hard to value things exactly exactly what i'm thinking yeah <laughs> yeah um well i i try to simplify as best i can these really complex ideas or feelings that I have about pricing. Um, it's actually in the course, there's a little calculator. It's, I, I call it a calculator and that's generous. It's really a back of the envelope thing. Um, you punch in a couple of numbers like, um, and it's really easy for, uh, for you if you are already coming from a different career and you already are generating an income, it's, it's actually easier to see those numbers translated because um, your uh, employer probably already has given you uh, a cost per hour of your time, if you will, you know, right. your wage or of your vacation time, what that costs and how much of it you get a year. So it's kind of easy to port that. For people who are coming um, into Flowers and not doing a career leap, then you have to start thinking a little bit more critically about, okay, what do you want your life to look like? Because and it's because it's, it's, it's a do as I say, not as I've done, uh, because I really burned through my 20s just living to work. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I, think I'm still do I think I'm still doing that. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'm too, but I'm working on it. I, I, you know, no. mindfulness is the game here. So we know that we, we, are, we, we have room to grow. Um, but yes, I, in, in this season of my life, I'm endeavoring to, what is it? What's the opposite of that? Work to live, live to, like, yeah, work to live. <laughs> work to live, yes. Right, right. And, and so it's sad that it's it's sad that we have to think about that that hard. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so working backwards, right, from right. the lifestyle that that I want and how that rolls back um, into the pricing, and and I guess because we have multiple people on our team, um, it's the lifestyles that I want our team to have too. You know, I, I want for our team to be able to own their home one day. I want them to be able to afford to retire. I want them to be able to have weekends off. Uh, I want them to have the opportunity to go uh, work remotely in Italy next summer. You know, something like that. So yeah. that's, that's how that, that's the starting point. And then I back it out into the pricing. Right. Cause yeah, cause then you can, once you get to that kind of a level, I'm sure it's easier to assign dollar values to some of those things. And then, okay, so in order for me to get to that level, then you have to really um, uh, assign perhaps new value. And I think, you know, the, it's interesting. And I appreciate you saying that because I feel like so many times people come at it from a different angle and it's really hard to get up that mountain where if you're up there or you're kind of imagining being up there looking down, um, it may be, you know, easier to see some of that. Um, I kind of feel like a lot of times that people struggle between that bird's eye view and the, the where they're at view. And it's either they're starting their business, they don't think they can charge a certain thing that maybe they are really worth, but they mm -hmm. feel like because they're new or because, you know, they haven't been doing it for 10 years or they don't have that luxury level of client um, that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, is there, and you, I think you said the word mindset a second ago, and that made me think, you know, how did you kind of approach that? Or maybe because you came from the corporate world, um, maybe, maybe that was easy for you. I'm, you know, I'm just trying to think as I know some of our listeners are, how, how do they navigate that? I don't know if that's a question or more of a comment, but I'm curious yes. what you think. Yes. Um, the other piece of pricing is pricing for the value you provide in the work. And that's, mm. That's very obvious, but I think it's not when you are the one creating that invoice because floral work is creative work and so much of ourselves is tied up in the creative. And when 
you're not necessarily um, the most confident about your work yet because you're new, then you end up sort of pricing yourself out. And I say pricing yourself out, and there's sort of an important story here is, um, I'll never forget early in our career when we lost um, a job because we were the cheapest option. Interesting, no right? Yeah, so you probably saw the look on my face. So I'm kind of like, <laughs> all right, okay, you've you've thrown the hook and I'm biting, go ahead. <laughs> well, I actually, I, we live that now too with our vendors. When someone comes back to us with a, a price that's less than we expected for the work, then that makes my mind think, oh, do they not know what they're doing? Is this a test for them? Am I going to be paying on the other side of this? Uh, I, I don't want to do that. So when we lost a job because we were the cheapest option, I, that was an aha moment for me. Is that um, then you sow the seeds of doubt for your clients and for your vendor partners, right? So I think the name of the game is really not overcharging, not undercharging, but just charging the right amount. And that's, that's a little bit of a game of Goldilocks. And that's gonna be unique to each person's situation and the market that they're in. Um, and also the kind of, you know, we talked about the higher level um, things to consider in pricing. Um, it's, it's very challenging work. Um, so yeah, um, and I, I also invite any of the listeners here to just message me directly and we can talk about some of the considerations because I really love working with um, creative business owners on this piece. So it's interesting you say that. Um, I was just, it's so funny. There's so many times that in our conversation, I'm thinking something and then you say it. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I am curious, have you throughout your business life as a, in this, in, in this, um, configuration of your life, um, uh, ha ever had a mentor or business coach or somebody that helped you kind of navigate some of this? Um, I have not, and that's not, uh, it's not without wanting one. I have worked with the San Francisco Small Business Development Center. They mm. offer uh, free or, you know, at cost consulting. Um, and that was really important for me at the beginning of the, the journey when Ivanka and I were both thinking, oh, do we actually, should we invest in a studio space? I just had a phone call with someone who was like, okay, if you can tell me exactly how every single square foot of your studio is going to generate income for you, then yes, definitely have a studio space. Just small little like, nuggets like that. So, um, you know, I, I wish that there, I had a coach or a mentor. I'm still looking for one. Uh, anyone who wants to mentor me, please. <laughs> reach out we'll hook you we'll hook you up well i i i it's just the way you said certain things that made me wonder but i know that we've talked about reaching out to these small business uh resources um that are in almost every major city and in a lot of lesser cities you know that aren't as big but they it's it's a great um it's a great i think it's score is one of the organizations that um, is really great for that. I know that we've even tried to have some conversations um, in our earlier days with podcasting with some, and and most of them unfortunately didn't know what a podcast was, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were we're ahead of the time there again. So anyway, um, uh, I appreciate your thoughts on those things and your insights, and so um, I, I always love to kind of wrap up our episodes with this advice question. Um, and it can be anything, something someone shared with you, or perhaps just something that's on your heart you'd like to share with our listeners. Ooh, um, you know, actually I, I took a screenshot of it because it was, it was so resonant. Um, and I, I usually don't read through all of the newsletters I get in my email, full disclosure. Um, this one comes from Stephanie Dannon, who was, the, who is. So why don't we stop for one second, okay. or on pause. 
And let's set this up differently because we'll probably edit some of that out. So why don't you say, just just refer to it as you re you received a newsletter that was really kind of speaking to you or something like that. That way, yeah, that way, uh, you know, because I we all get these things, right? But I mean, I'm excited that you feel comfortable sharing it. So anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, well, I, I clicked through and I received a newsletter, um, a, a September editor's letter that really resonated with me. And it's from the co-founder of Co, that's C-O, it's a, it's a clothing line, a mm -hmm. fashion brand. Um, and this is from Stephanie Dannon. And she, she writes, the need to reinvent oneself, I have observed, tends to arise when we are passionate and fearless about our choices. Passion and courage put you at risk of heartbreak, failure, and loss. But those are risks, of course, and the cost of living. And that was just so resonant for me. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate that too. I, and I feel like as creatives, and how many of our our followers are creatives? Don't you feel like creatives kind of? I don't know. This this is why I make these generalizations that get me in trouble. But I kind of feel like as creatives, I feel like that's every day for some of us. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. My um, my life partner is an artist, so he he and I share a lot of conversation about this. And we were talking about what we hope our son will do or will not do. Um, and the one thing that we've settled on is that we hope he chooses to live his life artfully. That doesn't mean he has to be a florist, doesn't mean he has to be an installation artist, but if he brings the toolkit of an artist to his everyday lived experience, and that's the spirit of inquiry and exploration, I will be a very happy mom. Well, what a perfect place to end our episode. Thank you so much, Amanda, for being on the Flower Podcast. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. This was so fun. We should do it again. <laughs>